Welcome to Chats with the Chief. I'm John Jensen, Chief of Staff at the Veterans Health Administration, and this is the podcast where we make small talk about the largest integrated health care system in the country. This week, I'm joined by Dr. Steve Lieberman, Acting Deputy Undersecretary for Health. We will talk about how he went from working at NASA to becoming a doctor, vaccination efforts, and VA's execution of 150 missions at federal, state, and local levels throughout the COVID pandemic. Enjoy the show. Dr. Lieberman, thank you so much for being here, and thank you for joining us. Uh, just been a great time getting to know you, working with you over the last several years in a couple of different uh, positions for you and a couple of different positions for me. And I'm really looking forward to sharing kind of the conversations that we've had, your experiences in the VA, your experiences over COVID, and kind of the conversations that we normally have, and to share it with uh, the rest of the employees and, and, the, and uh, employees and veterans that would be watching this. So thanks again for joining us. It's great to have you here. Such a pleasure. Uh, I am a big fan of the show, and it, it is just uh, really an honor for me to be here today to participate in this. Thanks, Steve. And it is a great opportunity to share with the, um, well, really with everyone about what we do, who people are, and really this is about trying to uh, break down those barriers between maybe central office in the field, but also who's in leadership in VA and kind of what we do. So before we get started, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, uh, I was born in Philadelphia, but spent most of my life in uh, the uh, beautiful Garden State of New Jersey. I'm a New Jerseyite, and uh, I've had over 30 years with the VA, have also worked in the private sector in some hospitals in the Boston area. Uh, I uh, have spent most of my career working in the field, uh, but uh, for the past five years have uh, been walking the hallways in uh, VA headquarters, as you know. Yeah. And, and, and so... How did, you, how did you get to VA headquarters then? I mean, I know you were very successful in the field, but what kind of brought you to the central office? So, uh, certainly early in my career, I was focused on uh, this great mission and caring for veterans, which is just wonderful, no better mission in my eyes, and then uh, teaching uh, and research and, and, and items like that. And then, uh, I uh, tried out a leadership position and found that uh, it was something that I never, I really had never thought about doing a leadership role. It's not like I woke up one day and said, I want to be a leader. So uh, I, I gave it a try when I was offered a associate chief of medicine at the VA in Boston. And uh, to my uh, uh, astonishment, uh, I found it incredibly rewarding. And I also noticed that uh, my brain seemed wired uh, to solving complex yeah. problems. Uh, I don't know if you if you caught the show uh, Queen's Gambit. I did. And um, the protagonist in, in Queen's Gambit, uh, in the middle of the chess match, uh, sees on the ceiling all the moves of the chess match. And um, when I'm posed a complex uh, problem, in my brain, I, I can see the steps and what we need to get, um, if there are folks that are not agreeing on something, how do we get consensus, right. and often how do we get to the finish line? It doesn't mean that I don't like to have uh, input from other folks, uh, because then you get an even better product. But as far as getting uh, to headquarters, uh, I was uh, called uh, back in uh, uh, December of uh, 2016, asking me if I wanted to do a four-week detail. <laughs> Uh, we were in the middle of, a, of the access crisis yep. across the country, and still we're having trouble, even though the access crisis has started in 2014, still hadn't fully identified what was going to be the right way forward. And so I was asked to come in and co-lead a team with Dr. Tim Tress Dresselhaus, the uh, chief of primary care from the San Diego VA, and uh, so came in for the uh, four-week uh, detail uh, to uh, work on this and uh, really rewarding work and ultimately that turned into a career-changing uh, event where I was asked to stay on and, and ultimately become the uh, Assistant Undersecretary for Health for Access, first person ever in that role, right. setting up an access office with a great team and then working with the field uh, on uh, identifying the way forward. Yeah, that was that was a time, and you would think that you'd be also now as the acting primary deputy, deputy undersecretary for health in uh, dealing with COVID. <laughs> so major issues that you've been able to handle and work through. So we'd like to start every show with a couple of rapid fire questions, kind of first thing off your head. So okay. just so people can get to know a little bit about you, okay. as well as I always learn something 
a book I should read or something I should do. So the first question is, is there a book, movie, or TV show that you're watching besides Queen's Gambit that, uh, that uh, would be interesting to others or something that would be interesting that I would want to try and pick up? So uh, I'm an avid reader. Uh, I start my day out. Uh, when I wake up, I actually get up a little extra early and it's, it's Steve time and I get my cup of coffee ready and um, start drinking my coffee and read something. And uh, so I've been reading a lot. I think I hear from a lot of folks in VA that they're reading a lot, many yeah. more books than they ever have. And I find it a great way to escape. And uh, one of the books that I've read uh, recently uh, is the author, his name is Scott Kelly. And in the book's name is Endurance. And Scott is a uh, twin with Mark Kelly. Right. Uh, who was uh, recently elected as a one of the two uh, senators from the state of Arizona. And they are identical twins, and uh, both are astronauts. And so the book Endurance is, uh, a, is the autobiography of Scott Kelly from uh, being a young child uh, all the way through to when he spent a year on the space station. And I got drawn to the book, uh, A, because he, we're in, sort of in the same age range, and he grew up in the town next to my oh, town. Really? Yeah, so, uh, so there were a lot of interesting parts about that. And then uh, in my um, prior to going to medical school career, after college, I worked uh, at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center in NASA, and so I've always been fascinated uh, with uh, space exploration and scientific experiments in space. And so I uh, was really looking forward to reading the book from That's that great. aspect. But uh, what I really uh, found, uh, what I wasn't expecting actually, is the similarity of what he went through in space on the space station for over a year to uh, what we're going through right now with COVID. And some of the, the, the take homes that I got from it was the importance of routines in your life uh, for him, it was exercise, and right. that's something that, that, that I think is important. Uh, also, focusing on food. Uh, I know a lot of us have been on the COVID diet where we've gained <laughs> right. uh, some weight. Uh, and for, this, for those of us in, in headquarters, our uh, COVID diet includes a lot of chocolate uh, every day. <laughs> and I think that's really important. And uh, also, just focusing on uh, the little things, the positives it's so easy to get to forget about the good things going on. And so every day I try to, to pay attention to all the amazing things right. that are going on during this pandemic, uh, how our team has, has risen up. And then finally, he really focuses on the importance of uh, family, friends, loved ones, and, and just he's focusing on these things as he is surviving in space in this tiny, tiny space, space in space. And uh, I just really enjoyed wow. reading that book. And, it, and it, I felt if he could do it in space, I can keep going right. on Earth. And so that, it, that's great. I had only seen fleetingly the book. And so I'm interested in trying to dig a little bit deeper into it. And anytime I travel, I try to knock out a book. And so that will be my next book when we, when we travel. And the reason I really love this show as well as most meeting with so many great people is learning something that I've known you for a long time and I didn't know that you work at the Goddard Space Center. So that's really interesting. Yep, Greenbelt, Maryland. Wow, that's fantastic. Okay, so do you have a hobby and what do you do or what do you do when you're not at work working 14, 18 hour days? So, uh, so I uh, already told you I read. And uh, I also uh, love to run, although as I think you know, I had a little yep. bit of, a, of an accident uh, at the beginning of COVID. Uh, you know, I was focused on my running as a great way to just keep my stress level down, which is what I've always found. And uh, unfortunately, I, had, I was running on an uneven surface and my foot wobbled uh, and I ended up breaking a bone in uh, one of my feet. And so that kind of put me out of commission for right. a while with, with that. But I am fortunately back to that. Good. Another hobby that I have that I really like is uh, hiking. And I uh, haven't done it as much, uh, haven't found as great hiking in the Washington, D.C. area, again, right. because we don't have so much time. But I love uh, any trail in the state of Maine. Uh, one of my favorites, uh, uh, Acadia National oh, Park yeah. in Bar Harbor, Maine. Yeah. If anybody hasn't been there, that's, to me, that's like the best place to go on this planet. Also, I've done a lot of hiking in Arizona. 
Uh, I was going to the Grand Canyon during the Clinton years uh, in the late 90s, and then we had the national uh, government shutdown. And even though when I called the Grand Canyon, they said, we're never going to shut down, <laughs> uh, they shut down. Really? And so I was there for about a half an hour and at least got to, to see how beautiful it, wow. that is just the most majestic place. But then said, okay, what am I going to do to adjust? And so started uh, going to state parks in Arizona, which are really spectacular. Fantastic. See, I didn't know that about you either. This is a great show. Just learn all kinds. It is of stuff. a great show. <laughs> okay, so uh, maybe I'm kind of more on the leadership side. What lesson, piece of advice have you ever received that sticks with you that you maybe bring out when you're talking to your team or or, or in, in in leadership huddles? So, uh, for me, and I learned this a long time ago from one of my mentors, and it's something that uh, I have found incredibly beneficial for my career and I always uh, teach those that I uh, uh, mentor, is the value of stretch exercises. Uh, the, the more you can go out of your comfort zone, the better. Uh, the more you will learn, the more you will grow. And so in my career, uh, I always step forward uh, when somebody says, hey, who wants to do this? And so uh, when I was at the VA in Boston, I took on uh, two really incredible challenges. One was to oversee the integration of two former separate VAs into what is now the, the VA, Boston Healthcare System. So uh, I was asked uh, by the medical center director, uh, Mr. Mike Lawson, if I would oversee the final phases of it. It was supposed to occur two years out in the future, but uh, because of what was going on, uh, morale was going down with rumors yeah. about the integration. and budgetary challenges and staff losses, uh, I was asked if I could do it and get it done in four months and uh, didn't know anything about an integration. And so uh, just like anything I approach, I, I, I look out there for who's already done it, talk right. to them, read books if books exist, and then get input from everybody who's going to be impacted by it. And then based upon what I learn, that helps me to, to identify the way forward. And then the other, the other thing that I, I took on there was uh, we were not doing well with customer service. And so uh, I agreed to build the customer service program from the ground up. Again, not knowing really anything about customer service other than it's a good thing to do. And so, again, took uh, courses, read books, uh, talked to experts, and then built a great team and, and got feedback. And, and then it was off to the races. and. Uh, and putting forward a lot of improvements. So uh, that was, that was, uh, those were two great experiences to my career that I really uh, benefited from. Yeah, fantastic. And I think one thing that I always think of when I think of you is your compassion for others and bringing people along when you're going through major challenges and getting maybe consensus, but collaboration with others. I think, in, I think of you in that way that I think you really you know, corner the market in that kind of thing that you're just so concerned about other people and, and how to get everybody on board to get in conclusions to problems. And I just really look up to that, look up to you in that way, of how you can make those things happen. So um, one thing I kind of always like to know, um, and what is your what is your clinical specialty? Pulmonary and critical care, so lungs and intensive care unit. Yes, and, and so what I kind of always like to know is, how did you first get into medicine, but how did you get into that specialty to start with? So, well, Maybe it's better to do the reverse order, if okay. I may. So, so getting into medicine. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, I was not going down this route. I was actually um, thinking of majoring in um, a music in college and uh, ended up majoring in math. Uh, and I think what I like most about uh, the math part was problem solving, right. kind of what we spoke about earlier with the Queen's Gambit. And uh, so uh, in, in healthcare, certainly a big part is um, solving mysteries. And uh, so that's exciting. And I really loved science. And uh, so that was a big part of it. And then also caring for individuals. My grandfather had a uh, massive heart attack a couple years before uh, I was, I, I actually wasn't really thinking about going to medical. I mean, I was and I wasn't. And really didn't like going to school that much and was really didn't want to, to go on. And so I was looking for other uh, opportunities. And so, uh, and I would, and I worked for NASA and, uh, but it, it, 
after I saw what my grandfather had experienced, how he was treated, and how uh, exciting it was to me for healthcare, uh, that all drew me uh, into that, uh, and, and it pulled me away from working in NASA. Uh, so it's just really caring and making a difference. And so uh, I, for pulmonary and critical care, uh, I think uh, that felt like a natural for me. Mm -hmm. uh, taking so, so pulmonary and critical care has very complex challenges. I mean, I think every specialty does. Right. But for me, there's a lot of numbers involved and physiology and exciting things like that. And uh, I was really drawn to the intensive care unit and uh, saving lives. Uh, or conversely, if somebody really is not doing well and is getting to the point of hopelessness, making sure that that individual right. uh, passes with dignity and pain-free and that all their needs are met. And so uh, I was just uh, drawn for those reasons. It's always interesting to hear a path that you've taken to get where you are, and we're glad you took that path to be with, uh, to be with us today, but also in, in leadership here in BHA. So um, I spoke earlier about, you know, kind of one thing I really admire about you is the way you really think about other people. And uh, one of the things you've been doing here lately, is specifically here in central office, is, is vaccinating employees and, and contractors and others that are working in the building. And so what has that been like for you? How, how has that been? Uh, I would say uh, incredible, uh, such an honor to be uh, uh, making a difference uh, in, in, in the health and well-being of the lives of, of uh, the staff we work with. Uh, I've been really humbled by the experience. Uh, some of the staff, or many of the staff come through telling me their stories and about how they're right. uh, uh, so thrilled to be getting the vaccine. And there were uh, two individuals who really stand out to me that confided in to me about uh, losing uh, one or both parents. And uh, it, it just really reminds me about how uh, serious uh, this uh, disease that we're right. fighting uh, every day here and that we're fighting in the field and um, how much it impacts on lives. And we just don't even appreciate, even the individuals that we work with, how much impact, you know, we know in their work life, but also right. outside uh, what happens. So uh, just just been such a great experience uh, to participate. Thanks for asking about that. Yeah, and I, and I think the same, you see uh, people's faces that are going through our vaccine clinics uh, about a sense of relief maybe, or at least, and again, I, we've talked about this before, uh, a beginning of the end and people can feel like, you know, maybe something can get back to a, what normal feels like. And to see that on people's faces, which I kind of never even thought about as we were going through COVID about what the vaccine process would look like. And, and you know, we're dealing with a lot of stuff in vaccine. I know you are leading the charge for really the department and all the stuff in vaccine. Um, how, how are things going in, in, with the vaccines? I know um, we've had a little hiccup with the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine, but how are things going overall with vaccine and vaccination for, for VA? I would say overall, uh, VA is leading the country with vaccinations. Uh, we're doing uh, well with the health equity issue, which is so important to us. Yeah. We did a lot of pre-work, uh, uh, getting uh, having listening sessions uh, with different uh, individuals from, from different uh, races and ethnicities and really understanding what it is they're looking for uh, to convince them to get vaccinated. Uh, uh, and so I would say we're doing a, a really great job. Uh, we meet regularly with all the leaders around the country and get a lot of important feedback from them to make sure that we're staying on course and doing the right thing. We're also uh, vaccinating some of our federal partners who have no other way to do it. And these are individuals who are in high risk positions who really are looking to VA to help them. And, and so I am just incredibly proud of uh, the work that the field has been doing, vaccinating veterans, uh, vaccinating federal partners. And now with the Save Lives right. Act, uh, we got that going within hours of President Biden signing off on the legislation. Uh, we just started vaccinating unenrolled veterans, their spouses, caregivers, uh, CHAMP VA uh, individuals. And uh, again, our, our field is just, just amazing. amazing. Yeah. They just say, yes, we can, and they get it done. So Yeah, so proud to be in this organization with people like that, that just step forward and say, I can do it. Mm -hmm. Let's get started. And, and, and they do mm -hmm. and are successful. It's, you know, it's pretty, 
it's great to be in an organization like that. Um, so we're talking about COVID. Um, so really, and we've worked very closely together since the beginning of COVID. We did before, but really in COVID, we were here 24 hours a day, basically for months. Um, you have led uh, kind of our fourth mission response uh, throughout COVID. So anything stick out uh, on the fourth mission response? I know you've dealt with other interagencies on what our fourth response, our fourth mission is and our response in states and other locations. But anything kind of stand out in there that you want to share? Well, there, I, we could spend <laughs> yeah. days talking about all the, the great things that VA has done uh, during uh, the pandemic. We've uh, uh, participated in over 150 missions and growing every day. And uh, I think what stands out most uh, to talk about one mission was the first mission. Uh, it was a very stressful time. Uh, we were seeing surging numbers, especially in the uh, New York, New Jersey area, and weren't really sure where this surge was, was heading and where it was gonna end, and everybody was uh, apprehensive, right. understandably. We were, uh, we were uh, staying on top of it, making sure we had adequate number of staff, adequate number of beds, uh, supplies or PPE, ventilators, and um, dealing with lots of challenges going on. So while this is all going on, we started to get asks uh, uh, first in uh, Manhattan area and then in New Jersey, can we make some of our VA beds available to help hospitals that were becoming overwhelmed with uh, admissions for COVID? Mm -hmm. And so uh, working uh, with uh, leaders in uh, Vision 2, uh, Joan McInerney and her team, and then at uh, uh, New York Harbor, uh, and uh, and then VA New Jersey, and um, in in the beginning, everyone's like, mm, I don't know. But uh, some of our leaders, such as Martina Peruda, just stepped forward and says, right. Yes, we can. We will open up beds. And uh, New York was really, and New Jersey soon thereafter was really. Some of the hospitals were really on yep. the verge of collapsing or being overwhelmed by these cases. And uh, over time, New York Harbor admitted 111 civilians, uh, which was just impressive. And um, other leaders there, such as uh, uh, the chief of staff, Patrick Malloy, uh, really just stepped forward and uh, again said, yes, we can. And we really helped out New York City. Uh, they were just uh, so appreciative. Yeah. And I think we all, we all weren't sure how it would go, but we did what we thought was the right thing. We never turn a veteran away ever. I think there is this um, this this uh, incorrect notion out there. We were we were admitting civilians at the expense of veterans. No, that never happened. Uh, veterans has been since day one our priority and has right. remained our priority. This was with increased capacity, opening up surge beds. Uh, we had DEMPS deployment there to help with staffing. Some uh, we did whatever we could to to ensure we could accept civilians, and we did it, and we did it really well. Yeah, we really did. Again, another very, very proud moment for us mm -hmm. in, our, in our COVID pandemic. You mentioned DEMPS volunteer. You've been a DEMPS volunteer yourself. You want to tell us about your experience in, in being a DEMPS? So uh, the, the DEMPS system is just uh, an incredible experience. If, you, if folks haven't signed up ever or volunteered for it, I uh, highly recommend it. It really is a life-changing experience. I was on the first ever deployment ever uh, in uh, Waco, Texas, uh, following Hurricanes Katrina and then Hurricane Rita, which is on the heels of that, and uh, uh, went into a building uh, that was an abandoned building on the the, uh, uh, the campus of Waco. And by abandoned, I don't mean it was in disrepair, just hadn't been used in a right. few years. And um, worked with the U.S. Public Health Service to set up a... Uh, a low acuity uh, hospital for 250 hurricane evacuees. And uh, it was uh, a bit frightening because we'd never done it. We weren't sure exactly right. how to do it. But in the end, what we did is we had uh, um, uh, over 100 VA volunteers there. And uh, we had busloads uh, of individuals that were showing up. And everyone's like, what do we do? Mm -hmm. And I said, just pretend this is the VA. What would you do? 
We work together, we pull together. Uh, we're gonna document on paper. That's what we did on the first deployment. And we just take care of the right. patients as they're coming in and um, we'll, we'll figure it out. And we did, people just pulled together and did the right thing and it, it was incredible. And then I went on another uh, mission a few years later uh, following Hurricane Gustav. Uh, we were in a, um, no longer um, the primary gymnasium okay. at the Louisiana Tech uh, 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 campus. And uh, we went in, same challenges, showed up the first day, there were boxes and boxes of supplies, nothing was set up, and we knew within hours the first patients were wow. going to appear. And then, so it was really just all hands on deck. Uh, everybody does everything, that was always our rule, and I think it's still the rule, uh, to just take care of what we need to take care of to make sure the patients get the care that they deserve. These are non-veterans, mostly, if they're veterans, that's wonderful because we can move them into the VA system. Right. Most of these folks are just so appreciative. They come in feeling hopeless, and by the end of their stay, they are just so appreciative for all we've done for them. They've never gotten health care like they've gotten from the right. VA. No surprise to folks in the right. VA, That's for sure. but uh, just just amazing experience that, that I'll always treasure. That's fantastic, and, and you mentioned earlier about uh, some of our fourth mission, mission issues. Uh, that we've completed, but you know, the DEMPS volunteers continue to just show up, step forward and volunteer to, to support us in any way they can support not only the veterans, but the communities that are in need. And um, and you also mentioned hurricanes, and unfortunately we're moving into hurricane mm. season, and, and we just continue to see just the great response from people volunteering for DEMPS and, and look forward to that in the future, and we'll continue to take care of them as best we can and take care of everybody that comes to us for care, and we'll always do that. Exactly. Uh, you mentioned uh, about Martina and Joan and some other folks in leadership, and I know, you know, obviously you being in, in the deputy undersecretary for health now. Um, what uh, has it been like dealing with the leadership throughout the system um, as we've worked in this pandemic and now with our vaccine response? And then, I, as I mentioned, moving into hurricane season, how has that been like and, and how, do, how do we interact with each other? Or how do we collaborate across the system? I would say uh, in the beginning of, of COVID, it, there were a lot of challenges as we were all trying to figure our way forward on how do we best communicate and how do we best work together. And I think within weeks, uh, we started to learn and get stronger and stronger. And so we have uh, daily calls, which we still have with leadership around the country. And I think that's been a really important uh, way to uh, get to for us to communicate and the field to communicate with us. And it's really a two-way conversation. And that's just been, uh, I think, such an important part of our success with moving forward. I, I know leaders around the field that I never would have right. gotten to know as well had it not been for COVID. I mean, COVID has, uh, there have been a lot of silver linings uh, to, to the pandemic uh, and so, uh, I would say we all work better together than we have. And I think uh, we appreciate, uh, I, although I've worked on both sides, so I, I mean, I've always appreciated the field. I think some of the, the leaders in VACO uh, that have never worked in the field truly uh, have seen uh, different aspects of, uh, of what is possible right. uh, in, the, in the field and, and how amazing the leaders are. And I think that the field uh, has seen more about uh, what they can uh, they can uh, uh, be offered by Vago leaders right. and how they can benefit from their input in helping them to knock down barriers. And uh, that together, the sum of us together is, is, is just, there's nothing we cannot accomplish together. So mm -hmm. just been an incredible uh, experience from that standpoint. Yeah, can't agree more. And so we, we touched on the leadership. So what about the employees? How do you, how do you feel the employees are doing today? And, and if they were to reflect back on the year, uh, of dealing with the pandemic, how do you how do you feel like the employees are doing today? Well, I think we we worry about resiliency, and this has just been a marathon, I guess a uh, ultra marathon, right. and um, we've had uh, little bits of breaks, but for the most part, even when uh, COVID is slowing down, then we're rolling out the vaccine or we are working on the veterans who have had deferred care. So this has been uh, really tough uh, on our frontline staff. There's no question about it. Uh, 
conversely, I know from hearing from a lot of, of folks in the field, and that's really great when uh, we hear from individuals. Uh, certainly, I know a lot of people uh, from my years in the right. field who are, are not shy for reaching out, but there's <laughs> also many other people who uh, over the past year I've developed relationships with, and I just, or even haven't, I have no relationship, but just people sending emails, uh, telling us what's going on, uh, telling us what's good and where we need to improve. And uh, I value that. I know Dr. Stone values that. You value that. Yeah. We all do. Uh, so um, I, I know this has also been an incredibly rewarding year for them, but it, it is, it's been a really tough year. And so we all... Uh, have to keep focusing on that resiliency and what we can do. And uh, we've certainly spoken uh, with our mental health leaders, our whole health leaders, to get their advice, and uh, also our leaders from the field in general. And one of the things that's been really important is you, you have to have a balance. You can't yes. just work 24-7, even though we all did in the beginning, and we kind of had to. But I know uh, fairly quickly, Dr. Stone and I had a conversation about that uh, everybody needs to take some time off at least one day a week. Mm -hmm. We can't just keep going seven days a week. And so Dr. Stone and I agreed that we were going to each uh, take a day off, as painful as that might remember. feel, yeah. and that, that we have to set an example. Mm -hmm. And so we said to the network directors and uh, the, the quadrat and the visions and the quadrat in the, in the field, and understanding that not everywhere had that luxury as the numbers of COVID were surging uh, in uh, New York and New Jersey and Detroit and Chicago and in Arizona and California and, and, and um, Louisiana and just everywhere. I mean, I could basically name every state right, yeah. that's been having surges. Sometimes we didn't have the luxury for people to take a day off. But um, also we discussed the importance of focusing on your, your coworkers, making sure they're okay, uh, this is similar to what right. we did in our DEMPS deployments. Uh, it can get tiring, and sometimes people don't realize uh, the impact it's having on them and their lives, and that once in a while you have to just say to your coworker, I think you need to, to take some time off. Maybe even just go take, take an hour or right. two of respite. Just you need to get away from this because uh, it just seems to be too much. And so it's really important we all look out for our coworkers. And I know that that's been going on everywhere, yeah. but that, that's another important part of it. Yeah, it's so important to recharge your batteries and uh, work-life balance has to be there because we need you, you know, we need you on station for the long haul. What challenges do you see um, in, the, in the future, in the next year, let's say, as we wind down, hopefully, COVID and the vaccine continues to, to, to ramp up? Uh, what kind of challenges do you see? Well, I, I think we're still looking at the future with COVID and what is it going to really be with these variants and the how, how long will the vaccine last for? Will there be the requirement for boosters? Uh, the deferred care is, is a big right. challenge that we are uh, working on and, and taking a look at. Uh, all of our uh, performance metrics that VA has always had much better quality, equal or better quality than the private sector. Um, it, how are we doing in that arena? Right. There's just so much to focus on. Uh, and uh, I believe we're doing well with that, but we just need to, to keep an eye on, on those kind of things. Certainly the EHRM rollout is, is a challenge. The caregiver right. uh, expansion is, is something that we are uh, working on and uh, making sure that we're on top of. Uh, suicide prevention remains our, uh, I would say, still our number, our greatest uh, clinical challenge with all these other challenges we're describing. And then certainly uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and, and including health equity. Uh, in many ways, VA is a leader in this, but in many ways, we need to, to do better uh, in this area. And uh, so I, I would say this is going to be our year to first of many years to truly focus uh, yep. in this area and uh, make it a priority for moving forward. And I know that you've made that a priority so in your time here and we're instrumental in standing up the Office of Diversity and Inclusion here in Central Office that reports to you. So any thoughts or comments you wanted to, to mention about the, the new office that's just stood up? So uh, thank you for bringing up this, 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 I guess I sort of brought it up, but uh, <laughs> I think uh, th this is an incredibly important topic. 
And I've actually been working on this in my career since uh, the 90s. Uh, when I was at Boston, we actually set up a diversity committee. Uh, we uh, uh, had summer interns with programs such as the Institute for Diversity and the Hispanic Association of, of Colleges and Universities. Uh, we had school at work program mm -hmm. for individuals that uh, maybe didn't have all the opportunities uh, to have the training required to move up in their career and um, implemented a bunch of other uh, uh, items. And so, uh, and, and as I moved on in my career, I've always focused on this topic. And so uh, for about a year now, we have been uh, planning for this. Uh, I think it would have moved even faster had it not been for the pandemic. Yep. Uh, we, we formed a committee, uh, mostly from folks from the field, and um, got input from leaders in this area. So uh, we met with uh, leaders in diversity, equity, inclusion from the University of Pennsylvania healthcare system in Mount Sinai, uh, New York City, and the Cleveland Clinic, and uh, even Google. And then we interviewed uh, over 350 staff from different levels mm -hmm. of our organization, uh, 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 early entry positions, mid-level positions, and senior positions, and from all different uh, diverse backgrounds to truly get feedback on what are we doing well and right. what are we maybe not doing so well and what do they think is the way forward? And that's when we decided that, uh, that, that this new office was needed, that uh, we agreed it was gonna report to me. Uh, we've been fortunate since then to recruit uh, a top-notch individual, Very Terry nice. Albritton. Uh, he uh, uh, hasn't been here long, but he's already uh, really impressed me. He uh, was recently awarded uh, one of the top 100 leaders in the United States uh, for diversity, equity, inclusion. So yet another reason we're lucky to have him Very here. Much. And that team that I mentioned earlier uh, has uh, outlined a framework of 30 goals, uh, short, medium, and long-term goals uh, that we are uh, working on implementing. And some of those are the things that I described that we had implemented earlier in my career mm -hmm. and uh, many, many others. And so uh, really excited. Uh, this It's just... It's so important that we have a workforce at all levels of our organization yep. that truly is as diverse as possible and as close as possible to the, the veteran population that we serve. Yep. Uh, the, the, there's, it's unequivocal that um, the, the data shows that uh, it makes um, for a um, better workforce, more innovative workforce, and ultimately leads to better outcomes for the patient population that we serve. And so uh, we're on a journey there, and it'll take us some time to get there, but I truly believe we will get there. Well, I'm, I'm really excited about the office, really excited about Terry, former Army, so who, uh, but uh, also really excited about your passion for it, because it really showcases in the way that the office is standing up and how Terry's leading the organization, and will lead the organization forward to meet those kind of goals and, and the things that we're trying to accomplish. And it's an exciting time for me, because it's places where that we should be and uh, the things we need to continue to work on. So thanks for leading that, and thanks for your passion in doing that. No, no and it's so important, and, and I'm not alone with the passion. I mean, no, all yeah. of our leaders uh, have the passion in, in headquarters, and uh, I, I know our leaders in the field are equally passionate, hungry, I would almost describe it, to move forward with this. And uh, we have some other senior leaders uh, who are really passionate and uh, are helping to lead the way forward, including uh, Maureen Marks, and Cameron Matthews and Larry Mall, so really appreciate, as well as uh, in the field, uh, Wendell Jones and uh, 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 Frank Vasquez. So yeah. a lot of uh, good folks that are working this yeah. topic. I think great more, more great things to come, I think, in that arena. I'm looking forward to that. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Lieberman, when we come to the end of our time, I cannot appreciate or sh show my appreciation enough of how great it is for you to have you here, to work with you every single day, and so I leave the opening to you to any kind of closing comments that you might have. Well, first of all, thank you to you for what you do here every day. Uh, you've been so important uh, for all of us as we have, have been here and, and struggled, just like everyone else has struggled uh, with this uh, pandemic and all the challenges that we faced. However, again, it, we've seen so many silver linings yeah. and uh, ultimately that silver lining is our frontline staff uh, who I am just 
so appreciative of what they've done uh, for veterans, what they've done for civilians, and uh, I think we've learned from that, we've grown, and um, this organization uh, truly has benefited. Uh, it, you know, we are, we are now recognized as a leader in healthcare, and uh, we're improving all the time, and I think that the best is yet to come, so. Can't agree more. Thanks again for joining us, and thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed today's conversation. A huge thank you to all of you for listening, to Dr. Steve Lieberman for his time, and our broadcast team for their production support. Join us for our next episode, where we get a chance to chat with the Honorable Dennis McDonough, Secretary of Veterans Affairs. See you next time.